The text that will serve as the basis for the sermon today is from Nehemiah chapter 8. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. And Ezra read from it, facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Grace to all of you and peace from God our Father and from our risen and ascended Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It's so nice to be preaching uh, a sermon that uh, is going to be experienced by people, actual people this weekend, and we can't wait for the time when we can all be together again and share in that blessing. But regardless of where you are and whatever you have lived through, did you ever think that you would see a day when what we just experienced would ever happen. I mean, it still doesn't really make sense when you think about it. And given what we have gone through and what we are going through currently and where we are at now, when you're a pastor, what do you say when things are starting to get back to normal a little bit and we can be together in person again? Where do you turn to for inspiration as you address a group of people that are still shell-shocked from their experience? There's only one place you can turn to at a time like this, and that's to the wisdom that is found in the Disney movie Frozen 2. So to set it up, the conflict of the movie has taken place, and the main characters seek out the answer to their problems from the wise old character in the woods. Pobby is his name, who in these movies has the ability to see into the future, except in this scenario. He cannot see into the future, which leaves everybody really confused. And so everyone still turns to him, looking to him for what they should do next, and he tells them this. When one can see no future, all one can do is the next right thing. When I heard that while we were watching that as a family, I thought, if that isn't applicable to us, I don't know what is. What is the next right thing to do right now? Because if we've learned anything from all of this, it's that we are not capable of seeing into the future, are we? Yeah, we know what eternity brings, done deal. Christ has taken care of that. But through this experience, we know that tomorrow might be very different than today is. So we should get down to doing the right thing this day. And to me, this is all very exciting. You know, I've said this since day one of the shutdown, and you can go back and look at the videos on YouTube and Facebook for proof of this because they're all there. But I said, I am very excited about taking this experience and turning it into a new opportunity for us as Christians and for us as a congregation here at Trinity. As we reopen our place of worship to be together, This is a chance for us to get in line with God and reopen everything in our lives. This opportunity before us is way bigger than just opening the doors to a couple of buildings. God is asking us to do the next right thing that he always asks us to do in his word, and that is what? Daily, reopen our hearts, our minds, and our souls to him. He calls us to use every day as an opportunity to get better connected to him to grow deeper in his word and to let him take all things and work them together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose this is a chance for us to reopen ourselves to him in a new and powerful way and when you look at his word from genesis to revelation that's what it tells us he says over and over again reopen to me so I can guide you through the next right thing. And that's what I want to talk about today. This reopening is a real chance for us to rethink and recreate what it means to be a Christian in our world and to do the next right thing, which means we start by asking some questions. And when we look at God's Word, He tells us the right questions to ask, and they are these. How can we be open to be a blessing to more people? How can we be more open to serving more people, to connecting with and impacting more people? 
Well, it all begins with opening ourselves to God and letting him show us the next right thing. You know, there's a reason that I chose this text as the Old Testament reading for our return. This is not what is assigned in the traditional readings. But I chose this for a specific example because we, as his people, need to learn from the mistakes of our ancestors in the faith like we see in the text. And if you're not sure about what this is all about from Nehemiah, let me catch you up to speed on that. The people of God had been taken away into captivity and taken to a place called Babylon for about 70 years. And after a miracle, they are returning to their home. Now, scholars believe that these events in Nehemiah take place about 100 years after returning home. So the people have been in exile, and they've been allowed to return to Jerusalem, and they've been allowed to rebuild the city and the walls and the temple, which is very important to them. So the scene we have here is when the exiles have been gathered together for a seven-day festival where they read from God's word and they celebrated the festival of booths or tabernacles, which is a festival thanking God for delivering them from slavery in Egypt. And after this festival, they confess their sins and they make a vow to renew to the covenant uh, to follow all of the commands of God that, is found in his, that are found in his law. And then they finish this with a celebration of the building of the walls of Jerusalem. And they are so happy to be back and worshiping again that many of them are crying. It's a super cool scene, isn't it? They have an appreciation for what God has done for them, and they're responding to it. Fortunately, it doesn't have a great ending. The people don't do what they promised on this day, and they slid back into their sinning. But right now in our text, it is good. They get it, and they're responding. And the reason that we have this recorded in Scripture is not just for the sake of history, but it's for a much bigger spiritual reason. And that's so we can learn from them and not make this mistake that they make later on. We're called to look at this example and want to do better. And this time that we're in right now is a chance for us to do that very thing. Because if you could go back to this group of people and tell them what the next right thing to do was, what would you say to them? I know what I would say. I'd say, hey, don't fall back into your old routines. Don't run to your sinful instincts. Remember what God has done for you and live like that's who you are now, the freed people of God. So what's the next right thing for us? The same thing. Remember that the blood of Jesus Christ has freed us from the slavery of our sins and to respond to that and to live like that. You know, we hear that so much about being freed by the blood from the slavery of sins. Is it really that big of a deal? Is it really that big of a thing? The answer is yeah. Sin is a big deal that we needed to be saved from. And if you want to put this into perspective about how bad sin can get, think about this. We live in a world that is so broken and so messed up from sin that a worldwide pandemic has taken a back seat to the sins that we have created ourselves. You think we humans have this all figured out? Every single day tells us we don't. Christ does. And he's promised that through the confusion and the chaos and the anger of this world that he will guide us through all of that. And that gives us the chance to reboot who we are and reboot what we are all about. We have a chance to be better. Let's do that very thing. Because what do we want to be remembered for? I say we, be, we, we should be remembered for being a group of people who went through a whole lot of really bad stuff together, but we did it all by relying on God and by doing the next right thing according to his word. You know, I said this before in a sermon a few weeks back, but I've really enjoyed that ESPN series on the 1998 Chicago Bulls team. That's been a huge hit, and it's had enough big moments in that series that it's created a lot of cultural talking points. And one of them involves a woman named Kathy Harrison. She appears in episode nine. She's what I like to call the foul-mouthed Pacers fan 
because she, as an Indiana Pacers fan, used to have season tickets right behind the Bulls bench. And she used to loudly and profanely yell at them and the other teams that would visit where the Pacers play. And these clips that uh, they show of her yelling at the Bulls have taken on a life of their own, which has led to multiple interviews with Kathy where she's shown us that what we saw in the documentary is not really who she is. But what is she going to be known for from here on out? In fact, in one of these interviews, she talks about the time she was in an airport and some of the De Detroit Pistons basketball team saw her and one of them shook his head and said, hey, there's that angry Pacers lady. That's what she's going to be known for. Not what she wants to be known for, but there it is. So here's the question for us. What are we going to be known for? As people of God and as a church, we have been made new by the blood of Jesus Christ. Christ has changed everything for us, including the way that we get to live and act. So what are we going to be known for? We have a chance right now to reboot and do things in a new way. And my prayer is that we would be a group of believers committed to the word of God and that he would, we would actually listen to what he tells us to live like in his word. That we would be a people who are known for patience and maturity and love and forgiveness and helping and always ready to go do the next right thing as guided by God's word. Because that's our God. He is the God of new beginnings. He's the God of recreating. He's the God of renewal. He is the God of reopening everything so that we can have new opportunities to love him and love our neighbors. And if I could go back to that documentary, as it came to its conclusion, what you really got from the documentary is how many people were analyzing Michael Jordan as the greatest basketball player of all time. And as they did that, it was interesting how many people emphasized not just his ability to practice hard, but his ability to always be in the moment. They said he didn't worry about what was coming down the road or give energy to how he might make mistakes in the future. They said he always focused on right here and right now. And in the documentary, they asked him about that concept, and he said this, why would I worry about missing a shot that I haven't taken yet? I love that mentality and that approach because that concept doesn't come from Michael Jordan. That concept comes from Jesus Christ. In fact, it is written into all of the universe that he created. And he put it into words when he said in the gospel, take care of the troubles of today and stop worrying about tomorrow because tomorrow has enough troubles of its own. So he's telling you and me as his people, stop worrying about what might go wrong if you do the next right thing and just go do the next right thing. Be here in the moment, right now and right here. Be my people. And you know what my people do? They follow my commands. And they go out and they do what I tell them to do. So get to it, my people. And how do you know how to do the next right thing? You look to Jesus. He takes all of the fuzziness out of how we should be living and he gives it clarity and focus and direction and he boxes out all of the other voices that are trying to get at us. And he asks us to ask a few questions as his people. Am I serving the world like Christ served the world? Am I a blessing to the world like Christ is? What's the answer to everything in life? It's Christ. It's always Christ. And when we reopen ourselves to him, life is a wonderful thing, even in the midst of the chaos going on around us. This is an opportunity to do everything better. Let's use it. And may God bless us that this concept of reopening isn't just applied to a weekend at a building, but is the constant way that we live our lives as his people. God bless it to be so. Amen.